Welcome to ABA Inside Track, the podcast that's like reading in your car, but safer. I'm your host, Robert Perry Cruz, and with me are my fabulous co-hosts... I'm Diana. And I'm Jackie. And we also have a very special guest joining us tonight. Please welcome... Hi, I'm Alan. <laughs> hey, Alan. <laughs> what up, Alan? Hi, hey. Alan. So, Alan, thanks for coming to join us tonight to talk about our topic this week, which is choice. Well, thank you for inviting me. Of course. I'm glad you chose to come. You didn't say our topic of choice? (laughs) Choice? Our topic of choice, choice. (laughs) The opportunity is passed. (laughs) So, uh, we invited Alan, Dr. Alan Carcina, if you couldn't guess, uh, to talk to us about his article, Effects of a History of Differential Reinforcement on Preference for Choice, from uh, the Journal of Experimental Analysis of Behavior. Uh, but also to talk generally about some other articles on choice and you know what is choice and some some interesting ways that we can use choice in our work with uh, individuals. So I think we'll start off with the big question: What exactly does it mean when we talk about choice? Hmm. Good question, Rob. Take it away, Alan. <laughs> Well, actually, that was the question that I was going to bring up to all of you. Oh, uh, because <laughs> I've turned it, the table. <laughs> <laughs> it's something that, uh, obviously, I've been thinking about for quite a while. The article that um, I wrote here that we're going to be discussing briefly, I wrote in 2010 and was working on it for a few years before that. But I don't still, I don't have a great definition of choice. And when you read different articles, uh, they define choice a little bit differently. So I wanted to... So to bring up here what people thought choice was, especially in the context of how it's studied. Hmm. Hmm. So should we all try and throw out an operational definition? We could. Then I guess mine would be selection between two or more visible or invisible events. Reinforcement. It doesn't always have to be reinforcement. Uh, items. Items. Just or items. events. Or events. Items or events. It's pretty good. Ooh. Okay. <laughs> Uh, you can find it a couple of different ways. You can One thing you can start looking about, since these are articles that have researched choice, one question you could ask, is it a dependent variable or an independent variable? Right. So is it something that your participant does, right? or is it mm-hmm. an experimental arrangement that you manipulate? Can it be both? Can it be? I know it can be a dependent variable. It seems like it could be an independent variable. What is it the articles that we read for today, though? Oh, I think they're all dependent variables. No, I don't know. The choice or pre- it was well, the, the absence, well, the oppor- absence of choice, opportunity to for choice. Yeah, is an independent variable. Yeah, it's difficult to separate, right? Yeah. Because it's mm-hmm. definitely the independent variable. When you look at, mm-hmm. I think all of the articles that we'll discuss today, you have a no choice condition, right? Right, mm-hmm. or a restricted choice condition in which there's either no choice or limited choice, Mm -hmm. and then you have the choice condition where a choice is provided. However, as part of that, the participant's also making a selection. Doing something. And that's what we typically think of as a choice, right? A choice is something that I make or that I do. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But when we're studying it, to try to isolate what that is and provide a, a more behavioral definition we have really isolated that more to the independent variable. So we have manipulations that we can make to look for our preference for choice. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. mostly in the articles, what we're talking about here is preference for choice. Yeah. And what we're uh, looking at is our preference for choosing, essentially. Yeah. All right. Now, do you have a problem with the terminology making a choice versus choosing? Well, the... the sort of elephant in the room when a bunch of behavior analysts get together and talk <laughs> about choice is that that very quickly comes into free will, mm-hmm. right? Which then leads to difficulties related to behavior being lawful and determined. And are we talking about something that isn't quite in line with that? Are we talking about something that's special? Or are we merely talking about selection that still can be determined? Right? Yeah. So yeah. When, when you talk about it as independent variable, here's more choice or here's an arrangement with more options or whatever it is that they mm-hmm. uh, do, and here's one with less, but we prefer the one with more, then we can talk about the variables that, that affect our preference. Right? And a number of the, the researchers here have already talked about, well, maybe it's something that we learn over time that when we have more options, we get better reinforcement. So we prefer that. But it's still very hard to divorce that dependent variable part of it. 
and uh, maybe when you talk about or we talk about the tiger article later, we could talk about an extension of that very briefly. Yeah. That kind of merges the independent variable and dependent variable together. Hmm. Uh, okay. Because there still is, even when you're selecting between the choice and no choice, there still is the act of choosing in mm-hmm. one that's absent from the other. Right. I personally have no problem, behaviorally speaking, when thinking about selection and making making a choice or choosing. To I don't me, it either. fits within the way that we think about it. Right, because Behavior. choice is going to be determined by the terminal link, I guess one would say, right? And your preference for choice by the, your previous history, most likely. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, previous history definitely has, I think, a lot to do with uh, our preference for choice in different situations. And you know, it's contextual as well. I think you know, there are certain situations where you might prefer to have choice, right, to have options. And others where it doesn't matter as much, and maybe even others where you actually prefer that someone make a choice for you. Mm-hmm. You know, if you're in an unfamiliar context and you know you're with somebody who is very familiar, like say you're in New York City, we were talking about that earlier, and you've never been, and you're with someone who lives there, you might prefer that they actually make the choices about where you go and, and things you see. But that might be very different when you're in a very familiar environment. Right. And other researchers have shown that experimentally, where they showed that students would prefer therapist choosing when it led to a higher preferred stimuli hmm. than when they got a choice which led to a lower preferred stimuli. Also, if you let someone else choose the restaurant and you say that you didn't care, then you get to complain about the restaurant selection. <laughs> so that gives you some opportunities for other types of reinforcement. Exactly. Right. Yep. Yep. Right. So you just keep <laughs> passively saying, I don't know. Whatever you want to do. That's Worst fine. choice ever. Yeah. That's what happened. <laughs> It starts, it starts to sound like one of those, you know, Lao Tzu uh, philosophy questions. Like, if you don't make a choice, isn't that a choice? I know. I think that's probably on my Facebook page today. That sounds good. <laughs> it's also a great Rush lyric. Uh, if you choose not to decide, you might still have made a choice. <laughs> so, let's get into the articles. And we'll keep coming back to that, de- that definition and, and talking about choice. So, Alan, I know... You wanted to kind of briefly go over the the article you'd worked on in in JAB. So I guess well, we give wanted us, Alan. To. We well, we wanted Alan too. <laughs> sorry, yes. We invited Alan here. <laughs> yes, sorry. I, I I'm, I'm more been in the sense of I forced my way on this <laughs> podcast. You just keep showing have up. Leverage over everyone here that no one knows about. <laughs> more more in the sense of we were going to focus on the other articles, but. Um, in the context of the invitation for you being on, kind of wanted to give us sort of the, the, the nickel tour of, of the article before yeah. we moved on right, to the others. Right, because really, Alan's article is sort of like a level-up article. Like, you kind of need to be wearing the tanuki suit to be ready for Alan's article. Mm. What's my... a tanuki suit? Yeah, I'm glad I'm not the only one who had no idea what that meant. Yeah. Oh, well, so you can be small you Mario. You the mushroom. You can get the mushroom. The or you can be big oh. Mario. Or you can get the fireball outfit. Or you can get the tanuki suit, which is like a raccoon outfit, and it makes oh, your tail spin around. That's called the raccoon outfit. Mm-hmm. No, the raccoon yeah. is different than the tanuki suit. It's the suit. tanuki suit, and it's pretty much the best thing that you can have on as Mario. What about Yoshi? Yoshi's a creature you ride on, I believe. Yeah, well, yeah. in Super Mario World, you can ride Yoshi. That's also pretty special. Okay. So, yeah. So, the, just Alan's article is more Yoshi. like that level. Tanuki plus Yoshi? Yeah. Because you can do both. Yeah. Well, I, I wouldn't necessarily say that, but it's a little bit more. <laughs> <laughs> As in, you would choose a totally different story. Nothing. I wouldn't really say that. <laughs> um, this one's Luigi. a little bit more uh, basic research, and that's wh- that's why yeah. it's in JAB. Yeah. It doesn't have necessarily immediate practical applications, although I think it certainly has practical extensions. But it was it came about really from the question of if we prefer choice in certain contexts. It, why is that? And I think later when we get into the Fisher article, they ask a very similar question and they talk about one of the possibilities of that being that we have a history. When we have choices, we get slightly better reinforcement or at least we have more control over motivating, op, you know, momentary motivating operations mm-hmm. that affect things. Oh, okay, in this case, I want this. And, and so it's a more potent reinforcer, right? And if you have a history of that, 
then even in situations where there's really no difference in outcomes, whether you have choice or not, you might still prefer the, the choice context. But I wanted to actually experimentally show that. So I, I created a computer game that had a different, two different options. It's actually sort of uh, modeled after the lottery. Mm -hmm. One of the questions that kind of led me to this was uh, why people often prefer to pick their own numbers yeah. in the lottery. Hmm. You, and, you're, a, you're a lottery player? I'm actually not. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, like close, very occasionally, you know, when it's friend. mega mega uh, <laughs> jackpots, but but I have played and I've, I've certainly seen and, and know people who play. And if you think about it, so there's absolutely no difference in terms of winning if you pick your numbers or if you get a quick pick. True. And choosing your own numbers takes a little bit of time. Mm -hmm. right? And what's more valuable to us than time? Money. Right? Well, time <laughs> is money. <right? laughs> So granted, it's only a few seconds, yeah. right? But if you happen to play a lot or you're playing a number of tickets, that could add up. Uh, whereas a quick pick is, is almost immediate, right? With that sort of paradigm in mind, I created a computer game that sort of mimics this, right? So in, in one condition, uh, your numbers would be generated for you. In the other condition, you could choose from an array of numbers. If you're looking at the article, this is figure one. Ooh. Yeah, the I'm, figures are really helpful. Yeah, on page 191. And so there are two different conditions. One was called you select, or the screen came up, said you select, the other was numbers generated. And basically they each had, in the beginning, equal odds of paying off, right? So the, the payment was simply a point, right? These were graduate uh, or undergraduate students who were volunteering for the, the research, getting extra credit for it. But half the time in the beginning, they would get a point when they picked one, and the other half of the time, they would be told you didn't win, right? And they'd go to the next try. And then they would cry. <laughs> I don't think they care. That much. <laughs> they just got to get that credit. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and then we set it up. So there were exposure trials, equal number. So you know they would play both when they selected their numbers and both when they were generated. And if they paid close attention, right, they would actually see in, in the beginning there really was no difference, right? They mm -hmm. won just as many times with one versus the other. Did people notice that? You know, I don't. I never asked them. Well, I, uh, yes, some okay. people did. Well, that's the whole idea is to set up right. that history of differential yeah. reinforcement, right? Yeah. Well, mm -hmm. in the beginning too, it's okay. So, what do you prefer, right? So you you you're, you have forced exposure. You get an idea that yeah, I win about the same, mm -hmm. uh, no matter what happens. And then it then there would be a series of eight uh, opportunities, right? Which one do you want to do, right? And those were those were the choice sets that we did. For this article that we're talking about, what I had a pool originally of eleven or more individuals. And we selected the ones for this study that didn't have a preference for choice or showed a preference for actually restricted choice. Okay, no yeah, choice. cool. And we chose them because what we wanted to do and what we, what we did is we differentially reinforced free choice. Mm -hmm. right? So you uh, select. So we rigged the game, right. right? And then during the forced exposure, they won a lot more often when they chose their numbers than when the numbers were generated. So not surprisingly, when they then got to choose, they chose the free choice. Cool. Uh, opportunity more often. Yeah. Right? They did that for the most part, even when we then stopped the differential reinforcement and returned to equal schedules. Oh. Right? So huh. if, Do you know, out of your like initial participant pool, what percentage of people preferred the restricted choice. You know, I'd have to go back and Was look. It in there? Well, in this article, if you look on, you could look in 199 if you wanted to. You could see. <laughs> um, That's figure six <laughs> you, for Johnson. those reading along. If the data points are near the X axis, mm -hmm. then there's really very little preference one way or the other. Mm -hmm. When it's close to one, there's a strong preference for choice. When it's close to negative one, strong preference for no choice. And the number of choice sets are along the x-axis. That's right. And then for other people that aren't looking at them, I'm assuming that these there's each panel represents a different participant. Yeah. So just eyeballing this, you could say that maybe about three of the participants 
really didn't have much of a preference either way, maybe a slight preference for a choice or uh, no choice. And the other four had a, a strong preference for the no choice. But I'm also wondering, like, how hard was it to find this group? Do most people prefer choice? Not in the context of this computer game. So uh, I had a, originally I had a few participants from, from where I worked where I did this sort of assessment, and I found a couple that preferred choice. Mm-hmm. And then when we opened it up to a number of graduate students or undergraduate students, actually most of them showed either not much of a preference either way or a strong preference for no choice. Oh. And there were about maybe three or four, I think, that showed a strong oh. preference for choice. So I wonder if it cool. changes in life. Like, as an undergraduate, you're like, oh, I don't care. I don't need to choose. But then as you get older, you get more well, Maybe you've, you've been punished for trying to choose before because you're an undergraduate student. Right. <laughs> who, who cares what you want to do or think? Just You know, I, I think it might have been just the arrangement. Like, I don't oh, know yeah. what this person wants. I'm in right. here. You know, I'm just going to hit some buttons mm-hmm. and see what happens. It's probably that, but I like it better. It's like low like, stakes. <laughs> you know? Yeah. They have low self-esteem. so right, they're they're like, they're I can't choose. <laughs> it's too stressful. <laughs> What is okay. in- interesting Thanks. to me, though, of those who did prefer choice, and again, you don't see it in this article, mm-hmm. but we did some work with them, and it's mm-hmm. published in, a, in another article. Some of them were, were very sensitive to contingencies. You know, so when it was equal, they showed a preference for choice, but as soon as you started to change the contingencies a little bit mm-hmm. and maybe favor no choice, they went to you know where the better payoff was. Mm-hmm. And then there were others who we literally had to put free choice on extinction. So they never got any reinforcement wow. during the exposure trials or the, or the choice trials, and put no choice on a high schedule of reinforcement huh. before they finally changed their preference. You see that a little bit in the literature, too. There's uh, an article by Rachel Thompson where there's an individual who just shows, a, you know, the, the intent was to do a parametric analysis and say, okay, at what schedule will they no longer prefer choice? And she couldn't actually get to that schedule. Like, whatever she did, there's a strong preference for choice. So, Alan, do you have a citation for that article in case anyone wants to read it at home? I do, actually. So that was uh, Rachel Thompson, Wayne Fisher, and Stephanie Contrushi. Uh, and that was done in 1998. And I think it was published in Research and Developmental Disabilities. Cool. Okay. You folks at home, readers. They want more reading. More readings. <laughs> so, awesome. uh, and again, that was an article where the participant showed a strong preference for choice that was really resistant to reinforcement contingencies uh, up until a certain point, or at least they, they, I think they gave up at a certain point. Hmm. But that's not the participants from the study that I had in JF, right? Hmm. So these were all right. participants who really didn't show a strong preference to begin with, or actually more of a strong preference for no choice. For anyone who attempts to, to read this article, it's <laughs> nice and easy in the beginning, but it quickly gets into the weeds. Uh, there were a lot of things I had to do to sort of try to isolate choice. You know, I had random ratio mm-hmm. schedules, so I had to see what the real schedules were and so on. So uh, I apologize for that. But the take-home point... had to be point, done. Well, I, I, did, I didn't need to do that. But <laughs> the take-home point, though, is, is pretty simple and pretty clear. For most of the participants... Uh, they didn't display a preference for choice in this context until the responding was differentially reinforced for choosing the free choice condition. And then I believe five out of the seven uh, continued to show a preference for choice even when the outcomes were equal. And then we did a reversal for, for many of them and were able to change their preference by differentially reinforcing the restricted choice condition again. And for most of them then, after that, it didn't then change to a preference for restricted choice, but it never, it didn't get recaptured either. It was sort Mm -hmm. of, we didn't have much time to do many more sessions, but for most of them, it was right around really no preference either Hmm. way. That's interesting. All right. So for people that want to study choice, what are some challenges that they might have if they're looking to do some research on choice? Well, one of the biggest challenges is actually isolating choice, right? And I yeah. think you know, the articles that we read today all did it a different way. Mm-hmm. Some of the advantages that my article had was, you know, one of the concerns you have is if you have two conditions and there's one that's choice and there's one that's no choice, 
how do you control reinforcement? Right. Right. So in the choice one, if I really get to choose between two items, then I might get a better item than in the no choice. Right. Right. You know, do you want to get into the different ways of doing that now, or do you want to? Well, why don't we get into the articles and we can yeah. kind of come come around how how uh, how Fisher and Tiger did it, and then you know if, if there are yeah. any that you know, they missed yes. or that or that you you, you want yeah. to add to it, Alan, you can. Okay. We can do that. So. Yeah. Thank you for that for the summary of that. That sounds like a fun game. I always like computer game research. I did. I wrote that when it was described. I wrote fun. <laughs> well, uh, I, I will share. One of the participants told uh, the, an experimenter that worked on it with me, Nicole Rodriguez, who was great mm-hmm. and awesome. Yep. Hey, Nicole. Uh, <laughs> hey, Nicole. But apparently he, he came up to her and said, I hope Alan's getting some really good data from this because this game is so boring. Oh, <laughs> you didn't make it fun <laughs> enough. <laughs> That's sad. Oh, that must have hurt your feelings. No, I was actually okay with that. Oh, okay. Yeah, when I was a graduate student and I needed psychology credit, anything on the computer, I was like, ooh, this is so exciting. But well, when you were a psychology undergraduate, computers were just IBM. Hi, mom. So fun. <laughs> These jaded millennials, what are they going to do? So let's, let's get into the articles. Let's start with Fisher, Thompson, Piazza, Crossland, and Gotchen from the Journal of Applied Behavior Analysis, 1997, on the relative reinforcing effects of choice and differential consequences. Jackie, you are going to lead us in this discussion, so why don't you take it away? Sure. Briefly, Fisher and his colleagues laid out two possible reasons why choice making may occur in their introduction, one of which was choice may lead to access to more preferred stimuli, And another was that choice may in itself be reinforcing. And what he found when he looked at the research was that most of the research prior to his research used a single operant paradigm arrangement. Do you call it a paradigm? It's kind of an arrangement. It's an arrangement. I love the word paradigm. I do too. I kind of wish. Me too. Am I a paradigm? (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, it's a single operant arrangement. And so what he wanted to do was kind of isolate the variables of choice by using a concurrent operands arrangement um, and try to see is it access to preferred stimuli or is it in itself reinforcing if the consequences are the same. Three children participated all with varying degrees of intellectual disabilities and they again used the concurrent operands arrangement. The nice thing that they did though I love it when experimenters do the raised followed by preference assessments to identify high preferred and low preferred stimuli. I like it when when they do that because sometimes you see research and they're like, we just talked to them and they said they like this and that's what we used. Um, and I don't love that. Especially warning, here. Warning. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Throw this paper away! But they didn't do that here. They used a, they used a paired uh, stimulus preference assessment and they identified two highly preferred stimuli and two lower preferred stimuli to assess in this arrangement. So in the first experiment... What they did is they had three key switches. I like to imagine that they're the that was easy staple. Oh, nice. (laughs) That was easy without that saying it, but that's what I imagined. I like to Um, imagine a very large, like ornate Phantom of the Opera style (laughs) organ. Oh. And it'd be like. But that may not have been what happened. What do you imagine? I don't have very active imaginations. <laughs> I just picture little buttons. That okay, so you got buttons. Switches. I was your yeah. I heard micro switch. I assume yeah, they're little like switch. toggle, yeah. little toggle right, switches. So you, guys, you guys think light switches. <laughs> Diana thinks Phantom of the Opera, and I think that was easy buttons. Okay, so I think we're all right there. <laughs> so they had three keys. They had a choice key, where when the participant pressed the choice key. They had the choice of either two highly preferred items or one out of two highly preferred Mm -hmm. items or one out of two low preferred items, depending on the phase. They had a high preferred phase and a low preferred phase. They had uh, the second key was the no choice key. And so what they did there was based on what the participant chose in the prior session, that's what they received as, as the reinforcer. So they didn't get to choose that reinforcer, but it was yoked with the previous session. Yeah. And then they had a third key that was just the control key in which they got nothing. <laughs> and responding still happened on the on the control key, which I love. Yeah. Well, they got to press the button. That is pretty Pressing awesome. Pressing buttons is pretty fun. Yeah, so. it is. 
they had a higher preference phase, a lower preference phase, and a higher preference and lower preference phase where they used that concurrent operands arrangement. And what they found was that no matter what, participants always chose choice when the consequences were the same, which is kind of cool. So for Lindsay, Jessica, and Sammy, our participants, they were looking at key presses per minute. So it wasn't, it was on a VI 15 second and a VI 30 second for each participant. So it wasn't, reinforcement wasn't delivered after each key press. But what they saw is that for all of the phases, choice had a higher rate of key presses per minute than no choice and the control. I feel like they, I would have wanted to keep going. Yeah, they don't do a ton. They only do three sessions or so per each phase. Yeah. It's pretty pretty clear, though. It is, but what happens over time? Well, there's a couple things, though. They're not getting the exact same thing. Right. Right, in the no choice. They're getting what they picked previously. Right. But sometimes you don't want what you had just previously. That is true. Right. I I like M&M's only some of the time. Skittles the other part of the time. <laughs> so, I would think that this would continue. You do? Uh, yeah, because, I mean, why not, right? It's I one switch or another, so there's not, they don't have to work any harder, and it's always going to be a little bit better if I get to choose. That's true. You're right. Yeah, so what if you modified the like lower preference stimuli to be things that are truly not preferred? Like, not... Aversive. Why do I want to use a burp? Or just Versus, so just low like, on your pin cap tone pole. versus this ball of lint. Which one do you want? You know, and there is there a point that at used which that. there was a oh there was when there was like the con- the, the bottom ball. of my purse contents. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That was you're funny. right. You're right. I remember who did that, but it was awesome. Yeah, I just found I thought that was I guess this is what they expected though, right? Right. Like people would prefer choice when the consequence is fairly similar. What I yeah, think is makes interesting. Sense. Yeah. What I think is interesting is their experiment two, mm-hmm. where they looked at is choice in itself reinforcing when given the choice participants will receive access to lower preferred stimuli versus when given no choice the therapist will deliver a higher preferred stimuli. There you go. Which is kind of cool. Mm-hmm. Um, so they use the concurrent operands arrangement again. Um, and here choice, you got the the participant could choose between two low preferred stimuli um, and the no choice they got 50% of the time they got a high preferred stimuli 50% of the time they got a low preferred stimuli and there da 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 you see a switch you see higher key presses per minute in the no choice condition versus in the choice condition for all of the participants and they did a really nice thing too is they did a little reversal where then They first did, you know, when you choose, you did the high preferred stimuli, you get a high preferred choice. Choice was high there, but then when a high preferred stimuli was followed by the no choice, responding flipped. And they could flip it on and off across multiple phases, which was pretty neat. Almost instantaneously. Yep. Mm. Once they contacted the initial contingency, I think. Yeah. So it's not just choice Mm -hmm. that is reinforcing. It's that history of reinforcement and what they're getting. Right. Mm-hmm. Did they turn Jessica's on and off? Jessica. No. I mean, they did certainly, the you know, the second phase, there's a reversal there. Right. But they didn't recapture the preference for choice. They probably should have run that out a little bit. I would have. Because you have that one high point. Jessica. <laughs> oh. <laughs> But I think that's interesting, right? Because right. Uh, when they, and I think they discuss this a little bit later in their discussion, they say, again, you know, why is there a preference for choice? Maybe it's that differential reinforcement. Right. And, you know, that's what appears to be happening here. And for Jessica, that makes a lot of sense. Like, oh, I, I've got a history here now where I choose, I get something that's a little bit better. Wait a minute, now that history is interrupted. Mm-hmm. Actually, when I choose, things get worse. So it makes sense if that's all that's going on, that after exposure to that, when she returns to the condition where it's really not very different, right. maybe she wouldn't show much of a preference. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So, and it's a little harder in some ways to explain the other two participants mm-hmm. who right. immediately go right They're back like, oh, and say, hey, yeah. let me choose again. Mm-hmm. Even though you're still giving me good stuff when it's the no-choice condition. 
I like how the authors describe their potential applied implications. So they said, I like it. First, it was encouraging to find that participants surrendered their option to choose when choice was correlated with decreased access to preferred stimuli. I just like that. I'm going to surrender my choice. (laughs) So I think that's good, though. I think it's helpful to discriminate conditions, like Alan said earlier, about, you know, choice isn't always beneficial if you don't know the outcome. I don't want to choose what street we're going to go down. Hmm. When we're in Chicago, Alan. <laughs> Alan and I got lost in Chicago. Oh, no. I don't know. <laughs> just kept walking around the same block, basically. Just not seeing the hotel. <laughs> this is pretty sad. We were so close. So many times. It was Siri again, though. Yeah. That's <laughs> leading us. Don't take that turn. Yeah. <laughs> Recalculating. Oh, but, I think, so, but I think that's so important. And I think when we... Hopefully we'll get to a point where we talk about teaching choice making mm-hmm. um, and really recognizing you know the the consequences and, and how they're different and where choosing may be beneficial and not beneficial I think is really important and also challenging for many of the students that we work with right even just yeah that's a hard skill yeah. to teach choice making mm-hmm so for those of you who are listening to the show and would like to apply for CEs, it's time for our first secret code word. And the first secret code word of the night is pepper. P-E-P-P-E-R, pepper. Like the stuff you put on food. They found it during the Crusades, or the Europeans found it during the Crusades. Yeah, it makes your spoiled meat taste less bad. Your, <laughs> yes, your maggoty meat will taste so much better with pepper. So the code word pepper. So let's move on to our next article, Tiger Hanley and Hernandez from the Journal of Applied Behavior Analysis 2006, an evaluation of the value of choice with preschool children. And Diana, why don't you lead on? Alrighty. I'm really excited to talk about this article because I've been talking to people about this article for a long time, except I didn't actually know the authors of this article, so I was doing sort of like the American Tale version of it, where you just go... Somewhere out there, Mm -hmm. there's this article that I think is really cool. (laughs) That's awesome. Yeah, so I was really pleased that I got to read more in-depth about it. And there's actually four smaller studies that they did within this article. So what I'm planning to do is orient you to the arrangement of it and then hopefully fairly quickly move through the actual findings of the different studies and those manipulations. And then give us take-home findings that you did here at your house. That's right, you know it. Woo woo! All right, so there were six children in this study, age three to five. Five of them were typically developing, and one of them had a diagnosis of autism. Everyone was involved in the initial study, in which they, again, just like the other studies we talked about, have presented concurrent change arrangement, in which in the initial link, the children needed to choose between choice condition, a free choice condition, a restricted choice condition, and a control condition. And then from there, they were given an academic task to complete, something age-appropriate like letter ID, I think, or sight word reading or something along those lines. They were given least to most prompting to complete the task, so that part didn't really matter. They didn't need to do it independently. And then once they did it, then they could either, in study one, select from five identical edible items. The example that they give is red Mm M&Ms. Or... They could have one red M&M presented to them, but there was no choice involved, or they received verbal praise in the control condition. So what they wanted to do, there were 15 trials in each session, and they ran several versions of that in order to see if patterns developed for choosing between free choice, restricted choice, or no item control condition. And what they found was that for three of the six participants, they preferred choice, so to choose one red M&M out of five red M&Ms, that's what they wanted to do. For two participants, they really had no preference between choice versus no choice. And then for the final participant, she preferred, she still wanted the M&M, but she did not want to, she did not prefer to select from five M&Ms. She just preferred the restricted choice condition. Huh. Yeah. In case you're wondering, this individual with autism preferred choice. I huh. thought that was... Mm -hmm. I was wondering, actually. Yeah, so I noted that for you. Now you know. Okay, so that was study one. They really just wanted to see 
did these preschool children have a preference for choice? And it was 50-50. Not everyone did. So what they did, did then in study two was take the three participants who did prefer choice. And in this study, they called it enhancing the value of choice. So what they did here, they wanted to see comparing the choice condition and the restricted choice condition. If they were to increase the ratio of how many items were available to choose from in the free choice condition compared to what remained in the restricted choice condition, did they start to see differences in responding there? So the change that they made, initially in the free choice condition, they had four items, and in the restricted choice condition, they changed it to two. So now you could pick between two instead of just receiving one. So there was actually choice in each of these two conditions. However, what they did was continue to increase the number of items that you could pick from in the free choice condition. So that number went up and up and up, and the other number remained at two. And what they saw there was that for, they kind of had varying results for the different participants. For one of them, she always selected from the larger pool, and they were actually able to do a reversal of the colors. <laughs> so uh, free choice was orange and restricted choice was blue. It's almost easier to talk about it in that way. So right. she always selected from the orange when it was a 4 to 2 ratio all the way up to a 32 to 2 ratio. I'm sorry, 16 to 2 ratio. And then they took it back down to 2 to 2. She always selected orange. And then they started increasing. They kept orange at 2 and they started increasing blue all the way up to, to 16. Did they do a color preference assessment prior to this to make sure the results mm. weren't biased? Oh, I, I, don't, I don't believe think they did. so. I kind of remembered that they did, but you read it more recently. I can't remember that they didn't, but that doesn't mean that I missed it. Only because, like, I actually prefer green M and M's, even though they don't have a taste. Like, they don't have a different taste than the other M and M's. But I would always choose green M and M's, no matter what. So I'm wondering. If they did that. They're taking oh. color preference to the item that they're using or color preference they, um, to the worksheets that are presented? Well, they yeah, had a the, link. They had the orange link. Yes. So the yeah. the orange and blue colors I refer to are the worksheet color. Right. But I, I wonder if... I'm just thinking about M&M's, but yeah, I could also that's think a about, good like, point. is orange my favorite color? I'm always going to pick orange, mm. regardless. Well, over time, though, you would learn orange means Maybe. there's contingency. Maybe not, so. though. <laughs> Maybe not. Some girls love pink. And we'll only pick pink, no matter what. <laughs> that might be true. That's Some sexist. boys might That's sexist, pink. Pink. also love pink. That's true. People may love pink. Some people may love pink. But that would be something that maybe if they didn't do it, that they should. Yeah, that's a good point. I hadn't thought about that. But if they did the reversal, it really wouldn't matter that right. much. Right. So mm-hmm. for, this, for Mona, they were able to have her responding switch from one right. worksheet to the other worksheet based on how they manipulated. Right. So for Mona, she probably doesn't have paradigm. a paradigm. She probably doesn't have a have a color preference. Probably not. But if they couldn't do a reversal, maybe that's one way that they could account for the results. Yeah, yeah. For the other two participants, for Mike, who's the second participant here, he always picked from the larger pool, and they did not attempt a reversal with him. So we always selected from the orange. Sample And then with Jay, his results were initially somewhat variable, and as they increased the pool of M&Ms up to eight, then he consistently selected from that pool. So maybe Mike liked orange. It wasn't about... Right, we don't know. Mike was also the participant with autism. Maybe he liked orange. Mm -hmm. But they also didn't attempt in the same way that they did with Mona. That's true. Which would have been kind of cool to see, but... Next time. Next time. (laughs) So moving on to study three. With this study, they used the other three participants, so the ones who did not demonstrate a clear preference for choice. And here what they said they were doing was looking at establishing the value of choice. So they started with the arrangement from baseline, or I'm sorry, from study one, which was five M&Ms in the orange free choice condition and one M&M in the blue restricted choice condition. As they moved through the study, they always kept the blue restricted choice at one, but they increased the pool in the orange free choice condition, up to 10, and then finally up to 15. For two of the participants, Stan and Nick, they as they moved over to a larger pool to choose from, up to 10, then they their responding started to occur in the free choice condition. And for Sue, it really remained variable. She was the one that initially preferred the restricted choice. So they were never fully able to sort of bring her over. 
This study, I think, is really interesting because there was no other differential reinforcement being provided there. It was only increasing the pool from which to choose. Mm -hmm. And they were able to change responding in that way, even without any... They're still just getting one M&M no matter what. And then finally, in study four, this again was the first three participants, so Mona, Mike, and Jay. And what they were doing here was quantifying the preference for choice. So in this study, they manipulated how much responding was required in the free choice condition in order to access the reinforcer. So they progressively increased the requirement to access the choice versus having the restricted choice always remain at one response requirement. So they increased the orange free choice from one all the way up to 32 responses required and really looked at sort of the switchover, changeover point for everyone. And it happened at varying points in time between from Mona, it was eight responses. She switched over to just selecting from the restricted choice. For Mike, it was up to 16 responses to switch over to the restricted choice. But eventually everyone sort of caught on that they could get one M&M for doing a 16th of the work. <laughs> and they, uh, what, what was it, surrendered their <laughs> option to choose. I like that J- Jay had four yeah, he was like, He's I'm like, out. He's uh-uh, like, no way. It's <laughs> enough of that. <laughs> M&Ms are not that reinforcing. That's great. All right. So that was the quick and dirty summary of Tiger et al. I liked this study a lot. And I was like, ooh, let's see what we can do now. What's the next question? Let's go on. Let's think <laughs> about that. You know, and you could just sort of see it like evolve and unfold as they were working with these it, participants. It is always it interesting cool. to see just kind of the iteration, yeah. the yeah. iterative process of like, oh, okay, but now we can now we can do this. Yeah, yeah, they were able to do quite a bit uh, right. with their arrangement and answer a number of different questions, which was nice. Yeah. And you know, I love that they started out with six participants and, you know, initially I think five looked like they sh- uh, showed a preference for choice mm-hmm. and then two of them eventually figured out, wait, I'm just getting an M&M no matter what, mm-hmm. right? So then they ended up with the three that preferred and three that, you know, didn't show a preference. And then they did different things with each of those participants based upon what they found and were able to, you know, create a preference for choice, enhance the value, and then do their parametric analysis. I like the breaking point. I think that's important to Mm -hmm. realize. Yeah, exactly. Choice is only so valuable. It's so much work. You need to work forever and you'll get one M&M. They get to choose my M&M, though. <laughs> <laughs> and and they I don't great, like red. Yeah. And they did a great job isolating choice. Right? Mm-hmm. Right? Mm-hmm. Which is hard. Almost. Almost. So, well, f- first of all, right, so they isolated it by, you know, there is really absolutely no difference in the items. Yes. Right? right. So either way, I get an M&M, mm-hmm. right? So even in the previous studies where they yoked, so, hey, you chose that before, maybe you want that again. You know, it could be, no, you just, I think there was one study they talked about where they were reading books. It's like, right. no, you just read me that story. Mm-hmm. I want to read that I book again. don't want that story. Yeah. Right? So they did a nice job controlling that. But that led them then to, you know, in their manipulations, all they did was change how many items there were, mm-hmm. right? So it always was, you only got one, yeah. no matter what, right? And I think they call that the illusory discriminative stimulus. Mm-hmm. I hope they spent a long time thinking about it. Right? That's right. good. Yeah. They're like sitting at home and be like, what is it? Illusory. I like that title too. So they did that manipulation and then I believe it was Schmidt, Hanley, and Lair published an article a few years later. So this was 2006. So I think theirs was 2009 also mm-hmm. in Java. Mm-hmm. And they tried to expand upon that question, right? And so what they did is they had arrangements, but in this case, there were multiple items. I forget how many in each one, but there were the same number of items in the choice Mm -hmm. as in no choice. But instead, there was a hand pointing either to the experimenter or to the child. So if the child picked the condition where the hand was pointing to the child, then the child got to choose one out of those. And if they chose the one that was pointing to the experimenter, then the experimenter chose one and gave it to them. What they found was that there was a preference for choice in that situation. So even though there was no longer a higher number of items, there were the same number of items, there was still a preference for choice there. I think that was a great manipulation to add. 
it is interesting, but then again, it starts to blur the lines between independent variable and right, dependent, dependent variable, variable. Yeah. right? So in one condition, I'm doing something. Right. Mm -hmm. In True. another condition, you're doing something for me. It results in I get an M&M &M or whatever, yeah. right. uh, either way. And that, you know, you mentioned control earlier. Yeah. Yeah. And to me, that, that's part of what choice is, right? Yeah. So when I'm choosing, I have more control or exert more mm -hmm. control. Mm -hmm than when choices are being made for me. Yeah, true. Yeah. Um, I think it was a nice way to modify this study in that certainly if you're working with small children or individuals with disabilities, they might see the bigger pile and presume they're getting the whole pile. Right. <laughs> you know, right. even I with would. repeated. Yeah. Right. So it's a nice way chance, to... chance, right? right. You exactly. Know. You're telling me there's a chance. <laughs> So it's a nice way to potentially account for or control for that problem. Right. Yeah. And even though the items are identical, are they 100% identical? You nope. Because your so, M&M could have a chip in it. Exactly. The M couldn't be written on right. there perfectly okay, right. Big. You get Sometimes you get the wonky ones. Yeah. <laughs> the or the chunk two chunk stuck ones. together ones. I love those. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I, I, I'm sure the Tiger and, and colleagues <laughs> made them as identical yeah. as possible. Right. <laughs> But <laughs> he's like, oh, don't use that wonky one. Yeah, take that one out. So in the in the course of reading this article and preparing for this, I also uh, had some participants running around my own house <laughs> that I thought I would run the tiger arrangement, study one mm -hmm. arrangement with. And I was going to share those with you guys if you're willing to listen. I want to hear mm -hmm. it. Yes. Okay. Cool. Right. What are the ages of our participants? Uh, we have one eight-year-old one four-year-old, and one ten-month-old. Ooh. Okay. And I did my best to arrange it just like they did in Tiger. We had three um, colored plates and three matching colored bowls. I used orange Reese's pieces for the two older children. I used Gerber puffs <laughs> for the younger one. <laughs> and I used uh, age-appropriate activities, so decoding spelling words and multiplication and for the baby, there was... I, was multiplication. <laughs> there, was nothing, there was nothing that he could do. So I just required an observing response from him. But I got different results for everyone. We only did one session uh, in the interest of their interest. But for the four-year... Let me... Yeah. For the four-year-old, I got... Responding was allocated about two-thirds of the time towards the choice condition. He thought it was really fun. This was fun for him. I did note that one time... He stole two. <laughs> so that in and of itself could probably maintain responding towards the choice. That is true. Right? Yeah. He snuck it in there. For the 10-month-old, his responding was uh, allocated towards the place with puffs, but he was indifferent <laughs> to choice versus no choice. <laughs> It's basically whichever one his eyes landed on, he went for. I did also, I rotated them. Mm -hmm. I don't know if they noted that in theirs, but I rotated them each each trial. And then for the eight-year-old who was uh, doing the multiplication problems, initially his responding was allocated completely to the choice condition to the point where I didn't think he was going to pick anything else at all. And then after seven trials, he got really bored <laughs> with the whole thing, picked the control condition for the remaining trials. And I asked him, I was like, oh, do you not like these Reese's pieces or, or what? And he goes, no, I like them. I just got full. <laughs> Basically, he just wanted to be done right. with the whole thing. And it was quicker to... That's smart that he could figure that out. Yeah. Well, he's a smart kid. But I also anecdotally could note that the four-year-old and the eight-year-old, when they started the little thing, both told me, I'm going to pick the free choice bowl until it's all gone, right? Mm. So they thought it wasn't going to refill. Interesting. Mm. Which is kind of interesting, and I feel like that makes it an entirely different thing happening mm -hmm. there, yeah. right? Like, they didn't know for the one that had one in it. They... So the free choice had more in it, right? right. So like, I'm going to pick that yeah. one that until, they're more until they're gone. Until they're gone. So he was, yeah. they were both saying, I want to do this five times, <laughs> <laughs> basically. And then when it started to refill, then that's when the four-year-old's responding started to change, and he started mm -hmm. to like try different different ones. And mm -hmm. then the eight-year-old's, he didn't want to do it anymore. <laughs> so, I don't know what that means, but... 
I know, so I thought that was kind of cool. Basically, the baby was indifferent. The four-year-old chose choice more often than not, and then until he didn't want to do it anymore, the eight-year-old exclusively chose choice and seemed to think it was ridiculous that you would ever pick not pick the choice condition. <laughs> so awesome. I know. So, so sort of like we're talking about with the undergraduate students is preference for choice something that is learned then possibly no longer has a reinforcing effect as mm-hmm. one goes through one goes through life. I don't know. I just think it depends on the situation. Right. Yes. Mm-hmm. And yeah. it, it, I mean this one was menial, right? Like mm-hmm. I'm not being mean to your study but Oh, no, like the was, response effort was, right, was, was really low. low. Yeah. The, the response and effort was low. They didn't really the have consequences any... consequences were yeah. dire mm-hmm. yeah. you know, by any means. I did have, in um, not in this study, but in the other one that was sort of related to it, I actually did have money as a consequence. Mm-hmm. And for those participants, they seemed to pay much better attention. Oh, <laughs> when the consequences <laughs> were... The consequences, yeah. Makes so, sense. Uh, there was a shift in their preference uh-huh. that corresponded to the consequences very closely at least for one of them right yeah. I, not as um, much for the other I also ran tiger study one with my two dogs you did yep and their responses were sitting laying and shaking hands nice and they were indifferent oh really yep completely <laughs> which is cute. what was your preparation how did you I had them on bowls uh-huh. So I had them away so we do preference assessments a lot in our house nice and I used the crunchy it's like the most high preferred. They don't like it when it's not crunchy, when it's like smooth or what's that word? Crumbly. Soft. Soft. <laughs> 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 when it's smooth, they they won't respond, which is awesome. It's like um, kibble? It's like it's like a crappy milk bone treat. Mm, okay, yeah. Yeah. So I had them on plates and they were away from the plate. And usually when we do the preference assessment, I put both plates out. Right. They were different colors, but dogs are colorblind. Right. Hmm. So. <laughs> that, Probably okay. But they can see different shades of. Right, that's true. Yeah. And then whatever plate they put their nose on, they got the treat. Nice. But they didn't care. They didn't care. Okay. Yeah. How did the choice work in that? I gave them both plates. Oh, okay. Right? Put the different colors. So first you had them, did you have an initial link? Yeah. So first I had them, I had them test out. Okay. Both. Okay. Mm-hmm. And then we ran it. And it was, it was... So they selected, then they did a task, and yeah. then they accessed? Yeah. And we'll see. It was, they didn't care. <laughs> but so your choice was, you gave two bowls, no choice was you just gave the one, the one bowl? No, I had a no. plate with, I had p- the same thing. Mm-hmm. Plates with lots of cookies. Play with one cookie. Oh, I see. Right, yeah. but they, oh, yeah. and whatever, they didn't eat the cookies because they know that's not allowed, but they pressed their nose on the plate. Hmm. Oh, but you, but then and you then would deliver. they had to sit or lie and down or shake. And they had to or sit or, or lie down or shake. Oh, shape. and then you would just deliver from the bowl. I was just right. going to say, how would they choose? Like, just take one, no, dog. No, no. <laughs> <laughs> one of my dogs actually would just take right? one. Yeah. That's good, wow. The other one would take all, but, um, <laughs> yeah, but they didn't care. I think they just saw treats. Really. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But. Interesting. Kind of like the, well, my 10 months. Right. Mm. <laughs> no. But we like to do preference assessments in our house. That's good. Dogs. That's that's cool. Uh, the animal research shows that pigeons and rats have value pigeons? choice. Yeah. Oh. Yes. Like that was a... Well, they right. They cited Catania, Catania 80, 1980, right? A bunch of yeah. times. Yeah. He's done actually a few with pigeons. Uh, and then the rats was Voss and Hamzi. The year 19... It's, it's referenced in... In mine, I think. Uh, 1970. Where they just had rats running down a maze, mm-hmm. and they could go one way that actually then broke up into two paths, or there was one there where the path was broken. Mm-hmm. And more often than not, it's more as a group design, but more often than not, the rats went down the maze where they huh. could go one or two I wonder rats. if my tasks were too easy. I'm not sure if you had more time and Maybe. desire to look at the arrangement and... And, and figure yeah, out if yeah. there are some changes to be made. But next time, has it been replicated in dogs? I guess that's true. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, now that we've had a chance to summarize the three articles, let's take a trip into dissemination station and kind of get into the bigger question of choice. How are we using choice? How do we apply choice? What do we know as a group about choice? Wow. 
we're here. I'm glad you choo choo chose to do that. <laughs> You're welcome. I was waiting to hear the train pull up. <laughs> it's my favorite part of the podcast. I know. <laughs> Been practicing. I've watched a lot of Thomas. We've got a morning zoo it up and have like buttons we can just yeah. press. Wow. <laughs> oh, are you wondering? All right. So what did we learn? What do you think, Alan? What is your main take home point? Well, one article we haven't talked about at all is the Bannerman article about the right to eat donuts and take naps or eat too many donuts and take naps. Yeah, and the reason I bring that up now is certainly in, and I think many people have, have read this article. It is one of those sort of seminal articles in our field. And if someone's listening and, and hasn't read it yet, if they are in any program, they probably will read it soon. Right. <laughs> <laughs> but because it talks about, you know, our need to provide an education, but also our students' rights to sometimes make some bad choices and, and how we balance that. But they cite quite a bit of research that shows that choice is wonderful, mm. right? So, hey, you know, in this study, people had much better behavior when they were given choices. And in this study, they did much more work when they were given choices and so on. But I'm beginning to wonder if, if the hype on, on choice is maybe a little overhyped. Mm. Uh, there are a number of studies that I'm coming across now that really show there's really not that much of an effect you get more of an effect if you do something like Fisher and all did, where you have a concurrent operance right. arrangement. Mm -hmm. And, they, you know, they talk about that as being sort of a relative value. So, well, I could do this or I could do that, right? So I could, you know, do something that gives me access to no choice or do something that gives me access to, to choice. Well, sure, I'll do the choice thing, right? I, I, your son said, why wouldn't you do that? Right, yeah. Right? Yeah. <laughs> Her participant, you mean. <laughs> yeah, uh, <laughs> your participant. <laughs> But when it comes down to it, if uh, I don't know if the absolute value changes that much. So, uh, yes, I prefer choice, but I'll probably do about as much work as long as you give me something decent, mm. right? And if that allows me to choose, great. But if it's something I really like, you know, money, I'm going to still do a lot of work, right? So you end up seeing very little differences when you add choice. And, you know, I've, I've encountered this when I've done sort of follow-up studies, I have not found a, a large impact on student behavior. Now, with that said, that doesn't mean that we shouldn't, you know, stop or that we should stop providing choices because we still need to teach choice making, right? And even if there's only a little bit of an effect, it's probably still better than nothing, right? Mm -hmm, so mm -hmm. providing choices has, you know, at least two benefits, right? A, you start to teach choice making, throughout the day for individuals who may not have that skill uh, well developed and then b you might get improved behavior or improved attending or you know more engagement if you provide that mm -hmm. but it's I, such an easy thing to do to build in those opportunities right you know it's kind of like when we were talking about pre-session pairing it's such an easy thing to do to just add in those opportunities to interact with your teacher in a more social, fun, friendly way before you're then asked to do work, you right. know. And, and it's more naturalistic as well. Like, you know, I know in my life, you know, it's not, okay, you have to do this, then this, then this, then this, then this. Mm -hmm. It's, oh, do you want to do this or this first? Yeah. Do I want to do this or this next? Like, it's not as laid out or scripted as our students' um, lives tend to be. Mm -hmm. That article is written by Bannerman, Sheldon, Sherman, and Harchick, and it's in the 1990 volume of the Journal of Applied Behavior Analysis, and it's called Balancing the Right to Habilitation with the Right to Personal Liberties, the Right of Peoples with Developmental Disabilities to Eat Too Many Donuts and Take a Nap. Two things I love to do. <laughs> nice. <laughs> Thanks, Jackie. You're welcome. Talk about a great title, too. I know, right? Yeah. You just have to say, yeah, that, that article where they ate too many donuts and took a nap, and everyone knows immediately what you're talking about. <laughs> so, Alan, how do you think, when you mentioned kind of choice is overhyped, is it just that the research, when you're looking at these kind of simple, simple conditions, simple paradigms, sort of allowed for that, that relative rate to be overblown, or just you don't see it as much when you're looking at more high stakes tasks well i guess what i mean by that is at least when i first heard about the research and choice it seemed like there was a very strong finding that you know, choice is, is very valuable right it's a value and it has all these great effects 
And, you know, when you look a little bit more closely at some of those studies, part of it was uh, many of them had difficulties really isolating choice Mm -hmm. as value. So there were some methodological issues. And then when you got better and better studies in terms of the methods used, then you started to get, for the most part, weaker and weaker effects. You know, there's still those studies where, you know, there's strong preference for choice that's resistant to many different manipulations. But for the most part, you often see, yeah, there are a number of participants that you know, really didn't prefer choice uh, or really didn't do much differently when choice was available. So I think it's something just to be aware of. Mm. Then again, there were participants who did better. Mm-hmm. So I, I, I'm not trying to say don't do it mm-hmm. right. uh, <laughs> at all. Uh, I'm just saying don't think that necessarily if you provide choice that all your problems are going to be fixed. <laughs> I like uh, that. Yeah. <laughs> And it just seems like the right thing to do. It does. Mm -hmm. It seems like the humane thing to do. It does. And I I hesitate a little bit because when you were talking about choices, I was just thinking about my son, older son, who will often choose, or has in the past, to play video games Mm -hmm. before doing homework. Oh, yeah. yeah. And I really would like to work on that so that he actually chose to do his homework first. Mm Mm-hmm. And then play video games. Because sometimes there's not as much time left for that homework <laughs> right, right. Uh, as I would like. <laughs> but I think that gets again to teaching choice making. It's not just you know choosing between A and B, but right. making you know some some good choices when the you know maybe the short term reinforcer is a little bit more attractive than the long term reinforcer mm-hmm. or. Uh, mm-hmm. You know, you have to weigh short-term consequences, long-term consequences, yeah. I guess, is what I'm trying yeah. to say. Have you had any thought as to how you might teach that? Teach that on? Because I know it, all the literature on, say, uh, even with adults, like, how do we get adults to do more at work? And that's like, oh, we could have these bonuses at the end of the year. Well, those never work because nobody cares about the end of the year. Right now, they can take a nap in their office and no one's going to notice. So why would I, you know, why would they, why would they kind of bust their hump I to like do that. more? Why would I? <laughs> and, and, <laughs> why would I? Why not me. Not why, me? No, <laughs> bad employees. I'm sorry. Uh, it, 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 it definitely feels like there's you know, what's the point of doing the homework first? I mean, certainly there are consequences to not doing your homework first, but they're so far away, whereas the reinforcing effect of video games is off the charts and so immediate. Um, Well, I mean, there's a number of different ways to approach that. One is you could look at the impulsivity uh, research or, you know, discounting research Mm -hmm. that that has been done and look at that as a potential treatment, right? Mm -hmm. Gradually changing reinforcement and so on. Another one that I think we often use with our children is rule government behavior. Like, so, yeah, right. you know, I could certainly tell myself, no, the rule is you do your homework, then your video games are available. And, you know, maybe provide other consequences if that right. rule isn't followed. Yeah. Could you make the, the, the quality of the video game more potent following? homework versus prior to homework so you can maybe... play pong right now or you can play an actual good video <laughs> right. game right or or you could say like you can play five minutes of video games before your homework or you can pay an hour of video games when your homework is done i mean you could try yeah you could try things like that as well you know i think for most of the individuals we're working with in in terms of maybe not our students but our children or right. you know at the workplace rules should, should go f- a long Far. way, mm-hmm. right? And yeah. Social Absolutely. consequences. Yeah. You know, and eventually you hope that other contingencies are experienced. So, you know, I said the rule is you do your homework and then you play video games. And then he does better in class, understands more what's going on, and gets a good grade on the quiz. And says, hey, you know what? This is working. It's really not that hard to do my right. homework first and then play. And then gets it becomes a routine, right? Mm-hmm. And I'm sure there are, you know, if, if you read the OBM literature, there are certainly other techniques you can use to mm-hmm. change employee behavior. But that's, you know, generally speaking, just uh, changing around some reinforcement contingencies, mm-hmm. which uh, we're all experts at, right? <laughs> <laughs> Except when right. it comes to ourselves. Yeah, or, <laughs> or our children. <laughs> uh, I guess that does become the long-term goal for anyone, though. Like, like you were saying, on the idea of it is hard to do for yourself, so how do you how do you teach individuals who have a hard time learning about rule governed behavior, have a hard time picking up those social contingencies? Wh- you know, where do you put in your practice about, about choice or is, is it something you would build in naturally just by having more choice available throughout the day and kind of hoping that has an effect or some other more 
more controlled situation mm -hmm. for yeah. training choice. And I think that's where the Bannerman article falls a little short. That says right. they have a lot of great suggestions. So if you hadn't been providing choice right. before yeah. that, do it. Uh, <laughs> and I can remember when I was reading that, I was like, you know, when I was first a teacher, there was an emphasis on getting things done. Right? Mm -hmm. so first you do this and you do that and you do that. And it's still kind of how it is. It's I think. still that way, but it has changed a lot in yeah. my mm -hmm. workplace where, right. you know, there's an emphasis now on making sure that the students have choices, mm -hmm. right? before i was like no it's time to do this and right. it's time to do that so i think the bannerman article was great and it you know really i think helped a lot of people say wait a minute no choice is important i gotta incorporate that but where it falls a little bit short is just adding in those choices and, and i think they recognize in their article too and say hey we need to teach it right but just providing it is not teaching it right right and most of our students aren't going to learn mm -hmm. unless we put more effort into especially the long-term consequences right. mm -hmm. Uh, about teaching them how to make those kind of choices. Mm -hmm. you know, I mean, do you want to do this first or that that first? Mm -hmm. Okay, that's a choice. And, you know, some of our students might even have a hard time initially making that choice. Mm -hmm. right. But that's still really a very limited choice mm -hmm. and certainly not the kind of choice that um, involves long-term consequences versus short-term. Mm -hmm. okay. I think most adults need work on choice-making. When you're talking about long-term consequences versus short-term consequences. Well, it doesn't magically change when you turn 18, right? Right, I mean, yeah. You, uh, right. What you Not hope... even adults with disabilities, though. I mean, no, no, that's what I mean. Yeah, typically yeah. developing adults. How many people do you see at the gym? I don't know, because I don't go. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. that's just, yeah. it's just uh, interesting to think about. As a society, you know, like, how can we influence better choice making well and that's important too I, i'm thinking now at work where you know we're really trying to promote a culture where people are more active right, right right and so but that's very difficult to do especially you know if you have people that are very busy mm -hmm. and and most of the people at our work are you know either going to grad school or doing other things so they are very busy tons of competing uh, contingencies exactly mm -hmm. but you know everybody wants to eat better or exercise or you know get healthier but at least theoretically exactly right. 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 tomorrow like, yeah, I do. Yeah. yeah yeah so I mean, but how do you change behavior there so you can, people make better choices right and, uh, and to what extent is it okay to to make a few bad choices i mean mm -hmm. you know sometimes the the bad choices we make are some of the better memories we have right, right? <laughs> <laughs> take home point <laughs> That's you can funny. edit that out later. Right? No, that's good. <laughs> that's staying in there. That's a quote. Cool yeah. What's interesting is that ABAI, they had a BF uh, Skinner lecture series of a man who started a company called, I think, Habit Design. Did you go to that talk? I did not. No. And so he's not a behavior analyst. He's just a really good uh, researcher slash marketer. He's in the social sciences. So all the research he talked about was like about feelings, and, mm -hmm. which is kind of funny. Um, but it's okay. But what he does is picks, he calls them habits, specific habits, and then tailors like a, basically a behavior plan for adults to then establish this routine, a.k.a. a habit, and they're usually healthy habits like going to the gym or eating, and he does it like very systematically. Um, you can buy this plan. You can like call them up. Um, is, it, is it like a complex systematically or is it more just like basic reinforcement? It's basic reinforcement, but it's like breaking down the steps. Like instead of going to the gym and working out every single day, you'll go one day and you'll just drive to the parking lot and then you'll leave. <laughs> and then like another day, you'll like drive to the parking lot, walk to the building. You know, like it's... Mm -hmm. Shaping. It's really basically, yeah, shaping. Um, but he, he designed this whole this whole company around this idea no. of, you know, forcing people to make different choices in their lives. And he works with, like, Google, big companies, um, <laughs> Tag Teach. He actually brought up Tag Teach. Oh, like really? Big companies. Um, <laughs> pharma. I don't know if he works with Pharma. I just like that word. And it was like, kind of fascinating to listen to because it's something that we do on small scale every day, but they're doing it with, like, thousands of people. Mm -hmm. Huh. Yeah, it's it's well. That's interesting. How you get that out? Because again, if it's just shaping basic reinforcement, can't everybody do? I mean, it, it's sort of it's sort of. Well, you could do this at home. Well, you could, right? But who's gonna hold hold you accountable? So I think that's one of the big 
ploys, right? Is that somebody's holding you accountable. Well, how is he holding them accountable your... different than say, I know I'm held accountable in the sense of if I pay for a gym membership and I don't use it, I'm blowing all that money that I'd rather spend on something something else. How how Well, that's Does you. he call you personally and he's like, I'm going to yell at yeah. you? Yeah. That's what they have. He has like contingencies in place, mm-hmm. which I think is yeah, no, that, that's really helpful. helpful. Right. Yeah. yeah, I would go to the gym every day if someone called me and yelled at me. <laughs> Definitely. <laughs> it certainly um, would make it more likely, right? Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Like, oh yeah, I don't, I, I don't want to avoid that. So right. I'm gonna go right. Negative yeah. reinforcement. Woo. It's pretty. In- it was pretty interesting though. Although not behavior analytic, how he talked about it, like certainly behavior analytic in nature. Yeah. And he was trying really hard to be humble and not try to sell the company. But then they <laughs> sold like a follow-up email. And they're like, if you want, I have it. To... And it's like, follow this, to, to follow this little wink. <laughs> Which was neat. It was very TED Talk-y. I think our general oh. like, course in life, we are encountering all of these contingencies. right? But we don't necessarily think about them as I've made this choice right. to follow this particular path. But then when we talk about the choice literature, it's as though there are two choices being presented and we even, someone verbally states to us, like, this is the contingency here versus this contingency. What are you going to select? But it's all choice. Like, everything that we're doing. Right? Or not. No, no, absolutely correct. I, I was thinking earlier, you know, you could have, uh, you could be a prisoner in solitary. And you still have an infinite number of choices Mm -hmm. that you could make at any time, Mm -hmm. right? What am I going to think about? I'm going to think about the past, the future, escaping, whatever. So everything you're doing is is making a choice. We could look at it that way. Now, granted, even though there's an infinity of choices you can make, I think it still pales in comparison to someone who, in our situation, where there's a lot more we can do, Mm -hmm. right? But I think in some ways behaving is choosing. Yes, mm-hmm. right. I agree. But At the most it, basic level. Yeah. yeah. But if we're going to talk about it that broadly, is it a useful way to think? That's why I still have problems <laughs> defining it. Right. You know, when, I, when I said I had issues with it earlier, I, I, I do. Yeah. Right? yeah. Because we can define it operationally, mm-hmm. and people have, and there's different definitions out there that are you know pretty decent, but it, I don't know if it captures everything that that word means in, in the layman's terms. Right. And, and maybe we're better off just, you know, only focusing on, you know, very operational, clearly defined, this is what choice is, and, you know, not trying to make something more out of it than, than it is, and mm-hmm. just stick with behavior. Right. Because we understand behavior to some extent, right? And choice is something that is still, for me anyway, difficult to understand because I'm still not really comfortable in how to define it well that (laughs) heavy (laughs) that's somber note (laughs) but also exciting we did a happy ending now (laughs) wait we did we need one we need one i'm sure we (laughs) well two roads diverged in a yellow wood and i chose the one less traveled Buy? Mm-hmm. Oh. Mm-hmm. I'm not sure. No, uh, I, no, I, no, I, no buy. I picked no the buy. one less traveled. No, I picked the one less traveled by, and that has made all the difference. Fact check. I distinctly remember having to memorize that poem, and I remember I memorized it at my mother's house, but I don't remember the poem, but I remember where I was when I memorized it. Hmm. Way back on. Remember, uh, memorized Snowy Woods. Oh, yeah. And stopping Whose somewhere. woods these are, I think okay. I know. His house is in the really? village. <laughs> <laughs> Two roads diverged in a yellow wood, and I, sorry, I could not travel both. And be one traveler, long I, I stood, and looked, and looked down, down one as far as, as, as I could, could to, to where it bent in the, the undergrowth, undergrowth, then took the other, just as fair. And having perhaps my the better underwear. claim. The better claim. <laughs> 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 because my underwear was grassy and wanted wear. <laughs> Though as for that, the passing there had warned them really about the, the same. same. My underwear. That's funny. <laughs> so, two roads diverged in a wood, and I I took the one less traveled by. So, there's oh. a lie. No. Okay. But it didn't say chose. I just added that. And that has made all the difference. And that brings us to our second secret code word. <laughs> Frost. 
Ooh, my favorite. I know. I totally wrote that down way earlier and didn't just think of it. So if you <laughs> need your second code word, it's Frost. F-R-O-S-T. You can capitalize it like the famous poet or not like the cold stuff that you get on your food in the freezer. That basically happened all weekend because it was very cold here in Massachusetts this weekend. It was yes. surprisingly cold. Mm-hmm. I chose to wear shorts. <laughs> and it was a mistake. <laughs> so I'll never do it again. It is June. Yeah. It is June. Well, so I guess if we had to think about how will we use choice? So tomorrow, it's going to be Monday. If you're listening to this and it's Saturday, good for you. It's Sunday. You don't have to go to work. But for everybody else, if it's Monday or Tuesday, and you need to say, how am I going to use choice today for myself, for the, the, the consumers that I work with, for the students, adults? How am I going to use choice? Or what choices will I present today? Or are we just going to shrug and be like, ah, I'll throw some in there. <laughs> Which plate of M&Ms will I deliver? I think we've established that providing choices as far as reinforcers for individual individuals we work with is something that's easy to add, can be, may or may not be ultimately beneficial as far as behavior is concerned, but seems like the right thing to do if we can, so yeah. I'm sure we will all make an effort to do that. We also know that if a problem behavior is escape maintained, activity choice is a nice antecedent intervention that we could potentially throw in to reduce the likelihood of problem behavior. Mm-hmm. Good. You know, you can incorporate choice into, like, like you said earlier, you know, choices of what reinforcers you're going to earn. Choices of what activities you're going to do, choices of the order of the activity, uh, you know, choices of where you're going to sit at the table, who you're going to sit by, who you're going to talk to, you know, which crayons you're going to use to color. Basically, just about any activity that you do, there's there's ways to incorporate choice. But we need to think about that as teachers, mm-hmm. right? Because again. We're still trying to get things done, right? right? There's still a lot that we need to get done and really helps when we can just say, hey, everyone, do this and have them do that. So, you know, I think one thing we could take from uh, these articles in this topic is just looking at what's my routine like? Mm -hmm. How do I work with the students? And is there a way to incorporate more choice? And maybe once a week, just say, hey, can I add choice somewhere? Right? Or maybe once a day, a little bit, like in somewhere in my routine, uh, add it in there. And, you know, if you can, take some measurements and actually see if it makes a difference in, in right. either engagement or compliance or behavior mm-hmm. of other types. Great, right? But if you can't, then you at least know that it, maybe it does and it shouldn't hurt anything. And it might also help, uh, you know, expose children to making more choices and being more comfortable with that Mm -hmm. i like that it's a good uh a good good end all be all right there and then for our own lives well we need to do some some more thinking and research and studying (laughs) Uh, but you know we can reflect upon choices Uh, i don't know (laughs) (laughs) Uh-huh. Choices. Well, they're good. Choices are great. We love. Them. Well, Alan, thank you so much for choosing to join us on our show. <laughs> well, thank you for inviting me. Of course, anytime. We love we love having guests, and and you gave us a lot to a lot to think about in the in the realm of choice. Yeah. Yeah. It's a, uh, it was a lot of fun. Good. Thank you. I'm glad you had a good time, Jackie and Diane. I hope you also had a good time, but you're kind of stuck doing the show, so meh. I'm not stuck. I I'm live here, good. so. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Jackie, did you want to talk about... I sure do. I always want to talk about it. I always want to tell anyone that is listening, if you are interested in a career in behavior analysis, I urge you to check out our Master's in Applied Behavior Analysis at Regis College in Western Massachusetts. We have a really great program and are working on more innovative ways to incorporate behavior analysis, both internationally and um, nationally. (laughs) So interplanetary. Look it up. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So check it out at regiscollege.edu. 
Excellent. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. All right. Well, for everyone at home, I hope you enjoyed listening. Thank you for choosing to continue to listen to our podcast. Uh, though if you are trying to listen to a podcast about behavior analysis, you have, I think, only two choices. So, <laughs> <laughs> hooray! Listen to them both. If we present them both to you, you'd prefer that than just being told you have to listen to ours. <laughs> right. In any case... Thanks for listening. Thanks, everyone, so much for being here and for the discussion. We'll be back next week with a preview episode for our next exciting topic. But until then, keep responding. Bye. Bye.